Good evening, Holman Street and all of our streamers. We're indeed glad that you join us on this Tuesday evening for our Bible study. We are excited because we have another one of our sons in the ministry who will come today and will give us our Bible lesson. And the person, none other than Pastor Matthew Davis. He, he's a son in the ministry. He started preaching at Holman Street 28 years ago. And he's been pastoring the New Beginning Church for the past 16 years. So now, get ready for a treat. Hear ye, Pastor Matthew Davis, the New Beginning Church. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you for another privilege, another chance, another opportunity to come this way. God, we thank you for blessing us and keeping us. Now, Lord, we realize that you are good and you're God. Besides you, there is no other God. And we thank you for just being God. Lord, we ask you to bless us now. Bless us by way of your Holy Spirit. Forgive us for our sins. And bless us, Father God, that you will stand, preach, and teach your word, that lives will be made to better. And we would tell men, women, boys, and girls about the God we serve. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Good to see everybody out tonight. Thank you so much for joining us here at the New Beginning Church. I want to thank those who are responsible for my being here. Thank you to the deacons. It is the New Beginning Church where I called my home 35 years ago, coming from the backwoods of Mississippi to the New Beginning Church and to the Holman Street Church, rather. Thank you so much, Holman Street, for, for allowing me to be in your presence tonight. 35 years ago, coming from Mississippi, this church became my home. I uh, came here with no family, came here with no friends other than maybe one, and uh, God has blessed me through this church. 28 years ago, I was licensed to preach here at the Holman Street Church by the late Pastor Manson B. Johnson II, and we, um, we appreciate the difference that he has made in so many of our lives here in this community, this country, and all over this world. I want to call your attention tonight to Matthew chapter 16. In the New Testament, the book is St. Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 through 17. The book is St. Matthew. The chapter is 16, and the verses are verses 13 through 17. When you found it, you will discover these words. I'm reading from the King James Version. It says... When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, some and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee but my Father, which is in heaven. Just for a little while tonight, I want to talk about the decoration of the church, the declaration of the church. We live at a time where the church has seemingly lost her power. We live at a time where the church does not have the decoration that we were used to in the 20th century. The declaration, that which the church ought to proclaim, 
we have somewhat nibbled away from this declaration that Peter, Simon Peter, refers to here in Matthew chapter 6. The church is at a crossroad. The gospel is needed like never before. Jesus is becoming less recognized than ever. There are many sects, sects as in S-E-C-T-S. -E there are many sects. There are many religious groups and there are many false doctrines that have invaded our land. The church as we once knew it has become less respected, less impactful, and less vocal than it was in the 20th century. These factors and many other factors prompted Jesus the Christ to ask his disciples two questions. The first question, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? The second question, but whom do you or ye say that I am? We must understand the backdrop. We must understand the history by which Jesus is asking this question. Because Jerusalem looked just like a modern day Houston. There were religions popping up all over the place. The god Baal, the Canaanite god, the god of fertility was being worshiped among men during that day. The god, the Greek god called Pan was being worshiped for Pan was the god of the wind, the god of nature. Then there was a temple erected to Caesar Augustus where men, women, boys, and girls would go and spend their time worshiping this temple rather than worshiping God. Then there were pagan superstition where people believe that if this doesn't happen, then we can't be blessed. If this did happen, then we will be blessed. So there was superstition all around them, much like the superstition that we face from day to day. What's your zodiac sign? Yeah, that was good for the floaters. That was good in the day that the floaters sung their song, their float on. That was good for the day for them to ask, what's your sign? I'm a Capricorn. I'm, I am a Secretarius. I'm an Aries. Superstition was all around them, and it prompted Jesus to ask the question, who do men say that the Son of Man am? And finally, there was what is known as polytheism. It is the worship of many gods that was going on during that day. I say to you today, you don't have to go very far to know that men, women, boys, and girls all over this land is still worshiping many gods. They're worshiping their spouses. They are worshiping their girlfriend, worshiping their boyfriend. They are worshiping Lex Us, B, M, and W. They are worshiping Chevrolet and Ford. They are worshiping their land and their house. There are idol gods being worshiped even today. I say to us, say to us today that we must answer the question. We must have the declaration and we must make it clear who Jesus really is. Even the church, even the preachers of the church are no longer calling on the declaration that Jesus is the Christ. Just the other day, a preacher said to me that your church is not going to grow like my church until you stop preaching that old-fashioned gospel, talking about Jesus dying on a tree and being raised from the dead. I say to him today, as I said to him then, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God 
unto salvation to the Greek and to the Jew. We must get to a point in this day as we were in past days to understand who Jesus really is. I know we live in a modern day society, a highly technological society that things can get around in a moment's notice. We have internet, we have Wi-Fi, we have TikTok, we, we have Facebook, we, we, have, uh, we have Twitter, we have everything that can get messages around in a moment's notice, but we better not forget that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus asked this question. Jesus asked this question because he was being bombarded by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These religious leaders thought that they really had it going on. These religious leaders thought that they knew the law and the law would carry them through. They practiced a law that was of old that Jesus has come to set us free from. It was a law where men would have to go in behind a curtain and plead the case of those who had sinned. And they would tie a rope around the preacher, a rope around the priest, and he had bells on the skirt of his garment. And as he had bells on the skirt of that garment, they would hear the noise that he was making as long as he was moving behind the bell, veil of the curtain. And when he got to see uh, the holy of holies, he got behind the curtain. If his life wasn't right, if he wasn't living right, if he had not confessed his sins, then he would drop dead in the presence of God. When the bell stopped ringing, they would pull him out and send another one in. Jesus set us free from that because Jesus is the one who died on Calvary. Jesus is the one who became the sacrificial lamb for other men and for us. You see, Jesus set us free from the moment where the old priest used to take his hand and, and lay his hand on the goat. And when he laid his hand on the goat, the goat would take out across the field and run out into the woods, run out into the wilderness as a symbol of carrying the people's sins far away. Jesus set us free from that because Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice. God laid his sin, our sins, upon Jesus who knew no sin, and he died. Right before the crucifixion is where we find these saints talking to Jesus in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus wants to know because the Pharisees are stuck. The, the Pharisees are still worshiping in their old ways. Jesus wants to know who do men say that I am. My first point to you today is there is a public opinion. There is a public opinion of who your Lord Jesus Christ is. There's a public opinion, and that public opinion is dependent on who we are and what we do. We have to be careful that the public sees Jesus in us. We have to be careful that the public's opinion of the saints of God and of the church of God is the same way it was in the modern, the, the first century modern church. It is the first century church that, that gave us a, a, a vivid image of who Jesus was. It was a first century church that's found in Acts chapter 2 where they, they broke bread from house to house, where they went from house to house fellowshipping, and they went from house to house, and the Bible says they not only met in the temple, but they met in each other's house. And the Bible says they had all things in common, and because they had all things in common, they were on one accord. The public opinion of us ought to be as such that they can see the church on one accord. The public's opinion ought to be over there at the Holman Street Church. We understand that they're looking for a new leader, but the fact is they're still on one accord. So we ought to see the public's opinion. Jesus asked the question, what do men say about me? 
Jesus asked the question, who do men classify me as? The public opinion in verses 13 and 14 are very important. Where Jesus asked the question, he asked, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Son of God, he wants to know what's the public opinion. And the public opinion is dependent on us. You see, if we say that we are the church, we ought to act like the church. A story is told by the church leaving the church building every Sunday. And they would leave the church building after church, and they would go down to a prayer place. And they would huddle down at the prayer place and they would ask God to send rain because they needed rain. And Awino watched them day after day, Sunday after Sunday, for two or three months. This wino sit on the garret on the porch for some of you all. He sit on the garret and he watched them walk back and forth between the church and their prayer ground, between the church and their prayer ground. So he asked the question one day. After two or three months, he asked the question, why y'all keep walking down there and praying? He said, well, why no, you wouldn't understand because, because we're praying that God sent us some rain. He said, well, the wino said, well, you all do not have any confidence in the prayer that you're praying. He said, oh, yeah, we're walking by faith. The church is walking by faith. We, we know we have faith because we, we trust in the God to bring it. The one old says, no, you don't have faith. And the reason why I know you have faith because out of all of you that's walking back and forth, buying down and praying to the Lord, none of you have umbrellas because you're not expecting rain to come. Let me just share with you tonight. The public's opinion of the church ought to be of such that they can see us walking by faith. The public opinion of us ought to be of such that, that we, can, we can show them Jesus and they ought to know Jesus through us. We ought to be Jesus walking around in the flesh. The second thing I see here in these few verses is there is a position of the church. If we're going to declare Jesus, if we're going to have a declaration of the church, the church has to take a definite position on who Jesus is. We got to take a position on who Jesus is. We have to stand and realize that he is the son of man. Jesus asked the question in Matthew 13. He asked the question, uh, who do they say the son of man is? Let me just share with you, share with you the reason why he's called the son of man is because he is human being. Jesus is the one who connects us to the almighty God. Jesus, I learned right here at the Holman Street Church, I learned right here that when Jesus died on the cross, we may picture him as dying with his arms stretched out. But the late pastor, Manson B. Johnson II, says that he reached up and touched the holy hand of God. He reached down and touched the, holy, the unholy hand of man and brought a bitter dispute to a happy ending. I want to resound that one more time tonight and let you know that the position of the church ought to be as such that we believe that Jesus is able to reach up and touch the holy hand of God and reach down and touch the unholy hand of mankind. The position of the church ought to be one where, where we trust Jesus, the son of man, one who was born of a woman. And I want to stop here and let you know that this Jesus that we're talking about, he is the hyperstatic union. That means that he's just as much God as God. He's just as much man as man. And the position of the church ought to be that we not, have, we not only have a man of God, but we have a God-man in Jesus the Christ. We must be satisfied with him and ought to be the church position. It ought to be the church position as we see that we ought to know who Jesus is. The third thing I see here in these few verses is the fact that there is the person of Jesus Christ. He is a person. He is the second person of the triune God. He is the second person of the holy God himself. We ought to get to a point where we realize and we respect the fact that he is the person of God himself. Paul says in Colossians that there was nothing that was made that was made without him. 
And because nothing was made that was made without him, he is God. What that says to us, when God said, let us make man, he was saying God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the person of Jesus Christ was right there. John picks this thought up in John chapter 1, and he says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And then verse 14 of John chapter 1, he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Jesus, the person of Jesus Christ, we must have that identity with him. Where there is no Jesus, there is no salvation. Where there is no Jesus, there is no heaven. Where there is no Jesus, there is no gospel. The position of the church ought to be found in the person of Jesus the Christ. The fourth thing, the fourth thing I see here in these short verses is the profession of Christ. When we baptize one, we say, we say, we say by your profession or your confession of faith. I do baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We ought to have a profession. If there's no one else who have a confession or a profession in Jesus Christ, the church ought to have a profession. Our profession ought to be that he is the Christ. Peter, Peter says that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You ought to have already reside in your spirit. You ought to already know within your character that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. If the church is going to be powerful, if the church is going to be unmovable, if the church is going to be impactful in the 21st century, we must come to the point where we realize that the profession of the church is that he's the Christ, the son of the living God. He is the living God. He's the living God. He's not a dead God. You, you remember, don't you? You remember, you remember, you remember, don't you? In 1 Kings chapter 18, when Elijah was on the mountain of Carmel and he met with over 850 false prophets and he began to let them call on their God Baal. And they called him from early in the morning to admit day and, and, and Elijah got kind of cocky on Mount Carmel. He said, why don't you call him a little louder? Because your God Baal may be on a far trip. <laughs> he said, why don't you call him a little louder because your God Baal may be busy. <laughs> he said, why don't you call him a little louder because he may be hard of hearing. Let me tell you, people have set themselves up gods that have hands and they can't feel have bodies and they can't move have feet and they can't walk and they may even have hearts and they can't feel our affection but i want to tell you jesus the christ <laughs> he's the one who can feel our affections finally my fifth point and i'll leave you alone there's a privilege of all of us there's a privilege. There's a privilege that all of us have because of Peter's confession. Peter confessed and he professed that he is the son of God, the son of the living God. When we look at John chapter 3, verse 16, and all of us are familiar with it, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wait a minute, stop just a minute, and look at that word begotten. The word begotten means that he is God's only unique Son. He is God's only one-of-a-kind Son, so we ought to profess him and him alone. I just want to let you know that, that Buddha can't make the trip for you. <laughs> Muhammad can't fix it for you. Only Jesus the Christ is available to all. This word Christ means Messiah. This word Christ means the anointed one. This word Christ means the consecrated one for both service and for the office. There is nobody like our God. If we're going to be the church of God, we're going to make sure, we have to make sure that our profession is clear. That we are not dependent on anybody else but God's Son, Jesus the Christ. 
This word God in the original Greek means the supreme deity, the, the deity himself, the divine one. It is the extreme one, the exceeding one. He is God. What I'm trying to tell you is he's the same God that stepped out on nothing in the midst of nowhere in darkness and said, let there be and light start reacting in the midst of the universe. That God is the God we do serve. He says to Peter, Peter, you are blessed. He says to Peter, he says, Peter, blessed are you. In verse number 17, he says, you are blessed. It gives Peter this privilege to know that he's blessed. Now, this word blessed is not just a momentary blessing. It is a blessing that exists from now on. It is a, it is a perpetual blessing. It, it keeps paying dividends over and over and over again. This word blessed means that you're well off. You are fortunate. You are happy. And not only are you happy, you are the supreme blessed one of God. Let me tell you, when you say I'm, I'm too blessed to be stressed, let me just share with you, you ought to be too blessed to be stressed simply because God is the one who blesses us. Because of Peter's profession, we have become blessed because of Jesus. He says, now, Peter, I want you to know that flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. <laughs> he, he says, he's, it's in the text. He says, he says, now, Peter, I know you're smart. I know you've been walking with me. I know you're intelligent, but I want you to know, Peter, that flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. He says to him, he says to him right there, he says, flesh and blood didn't reveal this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed this to you. This word flesh and blood means that, that no human nature has revealed this unto you. This word flesh and blood means that your carnality has not revealed this unto you. Your moral standards have not revealed this unto you. Your physical being and all of your intellect has not revealed this unto you. Let me tell you, if we're going to be the church that God is calling for in the 21st century, we need to hear from God. We need a revelation from the Lord. And God delivered me from so all these preachers that's talking about I got a rhema word. Come on over here because I got a rhema word. They're moved they move and they, they're moved by emotion and they're moving out of content simply because God has no new word. The word rhema word means that there ought to be a new word. There, there is no new word from the Lord. If you can't find it in the book, if you can't find it in the Bible, then it's not of God. There's one thing I know about the, new, about the Holman Street Church, and that is that you are in the word. I know that you've been reared in the word. I know you've been, you've been sanctioned in the word. One thing that I know about the, about the Holman Street Church is the deacon's been saturated in the word of God. It, it, you ought, you ought to be, it ought to be revealed from God's word. This word reveal, this word reveal means to, to take off, to uncover to take the cover off, to disrobe, to, to disclose, and to expose. Jesus says to Peter, Peter, you, this word has been taken off for you. This word has been disrobed for you. This word has been exposed for you, and you didn't do it for yourself. God deliver me from folk that think that their faith will carry them over. You know the faith that we have is not even our faith. The Bible says in, in Romans, Romans uh, Paul says to us that, that, that God has given to every man a measure of faith. Not only are we not saved of our own, not only is grace the one that saves us and we are saved through faith, the grace doesn't belong to us and the faith doesn't belong to us either. The only thing we can do is saturate ourselves in the word of God that our faith will increase. So he says, he says, he says, now, Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this unto you. But my father, God himself, my father, the one who, who sits high and looks low, my father has revealed this unto you. You see, God has a way of revealing unto us what we need to know. And, and he, he backs it up in his word. He backs it up by way of his Holy Spirit. God uncover divine truths as we allow ourselves to be ministered to by him. 
Finally, he says, he says, Peter, flesh and blood didn't re reveal this unto you, and I'm still talking about the privilege for all. All of us have privileges. <laughs> all of us have, have privileges that we have in Jesus Christ. Some of us have privileges because we were born in a certain neighborhood or we, we were born in a, to a certain family. But let me tell you, it's good news tonight. Deacon Roosevelt wouldn't always call me to be on his team. But one thing about it, I'm so glad that God allows me to be on his team. <laughs> He, he allowed me to be on his team. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it unto me, but my Father who's in heaven. Thank God I'm on his team. Thank God that I'm a part of his team. This word heaven means the abode of God. It is where God is. It, is. it is the sky. It is the air. It is the power of God. It is where God's power exists, and it is eternity. Yeah, it's because, it's because of, of Jesus the Christ that, that we have a right to eternity. It's because of Jesus the Christ that we have an opportunity to sit at his feet and be revealed. Things are revealed unto us. It's not because we're smart. The world is dependent on the church. The world is depending on the church to understand who Jesus is. The world is dependent on the church to promote who Jesus is. And we live in a seeker-sensitive world. That seeker-sensitive world means that, that we will change what God has placed in us, change what God has revealed to us in order to build our numbers up. I want to say to the Holman Street Church, never, never do things just to build up your numbers. <laughs> you you got to do what Jesus has called you to do. Don't, don't, don't leave the message. <laughs> don't, don't tear up your method. <laughs> Always stick to Jesus. He is the message by which we preach. And when we sing that song, I'm going up yonder, we ought to let men know the only reason we're going up there is because over 2,000 years ago, Jesus the Christ died on a stick. He died on a tree and because he died over 2,000 years ago and I believe that story I'm on my way to heaven that's what the church is all about let me just share with you preachers go to seminary preachers go and get their education their PhDs their doctor degrees and their master's degrees to come back to the pulpit and talk about a man who died on a tree and, and let me tell you, it doesn't matter how many degrees you have. It doesn't matter how powerful people look upon you. It's, it's all about the man who died on the tree. And he died over 2,000 years ago on a skull hill called Calvary, and he gave the privilege to all of us. We have to keep the declaration. In the declaration, what we declare of Jesus Christ is he is the Christ the son of the living God. He is the anointed one of God. He is the one that makes the difference. He is the one that makes the church the church. Let me say to the Homer Street Church, don't, don't leave focus. Don't leave the focus of the church. Don't, the, the focus of the church ought to be, and, and Pastor Johnson used to say it all the time, the focus of the church ought to be that Jesus is the main attraction. Jesus is the center of attention. You got to let Jesus be the main attraction. It, it's not about who's who and what position you have. It's about Jesus Christ being the main attraction. And when we make Jesus the main attraction, then lives are changed. Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. There may be somebody here today that don't know this Jesus we're talking about. There may be one here today who never confessed Christ as your personal Savior. This is your moment. This is your opportunity to get it right with God. I hear you, but, 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 but man, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been through. I want to tell you, it doesn't matter where you've been. doesn't matter who you've been with. doesn't matter what you've been through. Jesus gives you the privilege of coming to him tonight. All you have to do is receive Jesus as your personal Savior, believing in the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on Calvary. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He rose early that third day morning. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5 says that he died, he was buried, he rose, and he was seen by over 500 men at one time. John 3, 16 declares that God loves you so much until he gave his only begotten, his only unique son for you. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 declares that, that if you just confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died and rose again, you can be saved right here, right here today. If you want to be a part of the church, you have to be born into the church. You don't join the church, you get born into the church. Thank God that I'm born again. You can be born again right now. Just repeat after me in this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. We believe that if you, if you prayed that prayer and honestly believed the story that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, we believe that you're born again. We believe that once you die, you're on your way to heaven. And if you have prayed this simple prayer, why don't you contact the Holman Street Church and let them know that you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you prayed this prayer and, and, and you have invited him into your life, go to holmanstreet.org and let us know that you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And those of you who are in between church homes or don't have a church home, I know we're in a pandemic today. You can't afford to be out of church today. You need a church home. Go to holmanstreet.org, holmanstreet.org, and join a good Bible teaching, a Bible-declaring church. And then when you're in church, you ought to give money to the church. <laughs> Go to holmanstreet.org and give some money to the, to the Holman Street Church and be a part of this kingdom building that God has given unto you. I say to you, this is the decoration of the church. Jesus Christ is the only one who makes the difference. If we're going to declare anything, we must declare Christ, the Son of the living God. Christ, God himself. Christ, the Messiah himself, who has come to rescue us from all of our sins. We can't do it on our own, but Jesus can do it for us. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Holman Street Church. Please join us at, at holmanstreet.org. Give your offering there. Give your tithes there. And as well as go ahead and let us know that you join and you would like to be a member of the Holman Street Church. Also, let us know. Let us know whatever you do. Let us know that you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior. We'll rejoice with you and we'll be glad to have you. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. We thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the Holman Street Church. We thank you for blessing us. We ask you for leadership, for guidance, for direction. We pray that you continue to walk with us. And, and bless us, Father God, to hear your voice. Reveal unto us all those things that you would have us to know. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God.